Hello, welcome to Claret and Blue. My name's Dan Rowlandson, joined by John Townley this morning for an Aston Villa Q&A. Before we get into the Q&A though, a quick plug for our Claret and Blue Live end of season review tickets. They're now available on eventbrite.co.uk. The link will be in the description down below. They're free to come. You can pick as many tickets as you want to reserve a spot. Like I said, link is in the description. June 1st, Hockley Social Club. Come and join us to talk about Aston Villa at the end of the season. Q&A then today, like I said, we've got some questions being sent to us on social media. We are doing this on Facebook Live as well. So if any last minute questions come in whilst we're streaming through, we'll go to those as well. I imagine the most popular question we've had is about transfers and we will touch on that t- today as we go through. We'll start with the first one that I've got on my list though. Who in the current starting eleven do you think will remain in the starting eleven at the start of next season? Well, if you look at, obviously, across the squad right now, who, I suppose, who is safe? Obviously, the goalkeeper. I think, I mean, maybe you could have a change at centre-half in terms of Carlos coming in for concert or whatever it may be, but I, I can't envisage there being a big change in that department, really. I know there's been a couple of links to Paul Torres and whatnot, and that's to be expected, given that Emery coached him for years mm. at Villarreal. Um, and may, who knows, maybe there is a deal to be done there. But it's not something that I would say straight away, okay, we need a centre-half. I think that's actually probably, with Martinez, the sort of position where we don't need... You know, We could go next season and finish in the top six or compete in Europe if we get it without improving that department, um, in my opinion, especially when Carlos is coming back. Uh, across the back line, obviously, Moreno is left back. That seems to be um, set in stone for next season, although he does like to have a different profile of left back. So, Luca Dean, you presume he's happy enough to stay around, I think, um, being that sort of backup, but mm. also getting game time as well. He hasn't been bombed out of the squad altogether. Yeah, he's not starting as many games, but he is playing in almost every game. So, I think it's the opposite uh, flank where you've got Matty Cash and Ashley Young. Clearly, Emery has specialist positions and that right-back role is specialist like all of the rest of them. And I'm not sure if Cash and Young are exactly what he wants. And obviously, Young's got his contract mm-hmm. um, issue, I suppose. Uh, I mean, to me, Cash is more than capable of stepping up and playing a different sort of role to what he would have been doing under Gerard or Dean Smith. But that's potentially one position, I think, where there might be a new incoming um, moving into the midfield, I think the sort of double pivot looks to be safe and secure again. Um, then Donker on the bench is adequate for me, but maybe there's going to be an addition in terms of a squad player. But I don't think you can really improve on Kamara and Louise. The only issue is that Kamara has had his in- uh, injury issues this season. Yeah. So maybe there's uh, maybe there's a big addition in there. I'm not too sure, but in, with a fully fit squad, you wouldn't expect that to be. Um, you know, if he's available for the majority of the season, you wouldn't, again, pick that position to be necessarily upgraded. I think it's more so in that space where Watkins um, is playing, he's obviously partnering Buendir and Bailey at the moment, but neither have really grasped that position. And clearly we're yeah. interested in striker. He mentioned that as soon as he sold Danny Ings, that a new one would be coming in. Or at least a player could partner Watkins. Uh, and I've been linked to some big money signings already in that position. So that position and right back seems to be the two for me that are say most not necessarily most at risk, but potentially upgradable in terms of what Emery Emery would like. Mm-hmm. I think John McGinn and Jacob Ramsey seem to be quite safe, but again, there's probably more quality that can be added just for competition. Because again, you look at the bench. Who would you bring on if one of those players aren't available? If you need to make a change, it's either Katina or Traore. I don't think I've missed anyone there. Obviously, you've got Buendir as well. So in that in that space where you've got Watkins, who's going to partner him, maybe a bit of quality uh, either side as well. Mm. And eventually right back, if Emery wants to, um, say, bring in someone who's very specialist and Matt Cash can't do that uh, as well as he would have liked, but we'll see. A, a less sexy signing is a, a backup goalkeeper. Um, there was a question about who we'd like to sign later on, but we'll skip it to this one instead from Steve. He says, we need a better number two goalkeeper. Any thoughts who we might go for? For me, it should be a proper challenger, Emmy Martinez. And Philip in the comments followed up by saying, going to be hard to find somebody to be back up to Emmy that will want to sit on the bench for most of the season. I mean, number two goalkeeper is a, a, almost a specialist role in itself, isn't it? Knowing and having that mentality that I'm oh, not the number one and, and what that entails. Yeah, like I said, it's not as sexy as a, a, a £60 million pound striker, but it's an important yeah. role because if anything does happen to Martinez, whether that's suspension or injury, we've seen that you can't really rely on somebody like Rob Nelson. So I'd say that's a, a, probably a priority position this summer as well to to get a proper backup goalkeeper. Potentially so. Again, I think it depends on what 
Emery's plans are, for example, if we get into Europe, does he use a backup keeper instead of Martinez? For me, I certainly mm. wouldn't <laughs> because yeah, it might be. I don't buy the argument of um, you know using your squad for those competitions or even cup games. I know he played Olsen for Stevenage, didn't he? Um, yeah, I think so. And for Man United, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, to me, you, you just play the best keeper that you have and especially when he's one of the best in the world or he's, he is the best in the world by the award he got. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, potentially there's a backup keeper going to be coming in. But I mean, I have no names because it's, again, it's quite specialist. There isn't a, as you say, it's going to be a different sort of character and profile, isn't it, to bring into your club when it's a backup keeper because they know they're not playing games, especially when it's Martinez. The, whoever comes in, they are, even if they play as well as they possibly can and develop incredibly well under the goalkeeper coach at Villa, they're not going to displace Martinez ever. So it is difficult. And I don't think you can promise them conference league games or anything like that either even if we get there mm-hmm. I mean maybe Emery will because say chose to do that um, against United and Stevenage but for me you play Martinez in every game anyway obviously if there's an injury and then that sort of um, changes the um, the sort of perspective on it but yeah it's a good shout because I don't think Olsen's sort of covered himself in too much glory since he's come to the club I think the Tottenham game away was it's always good as it's got so far. Obviously, kept a clean sheet. But apart from that, it's always been jittery moments. And that does sort of bleed through the team. So, yeah, that's potentially an area. Um, we'll see how that goes. But again, it's not the sort of, uh, as you say, sexy £60 million pound, um, signing that, that we hope to be making uh, further up the pitch. Uh, next question. Again, I've not really given these much thought. I'm hoping that you have for some proper homework, but I'll try, I'll try and wing it through as we go through. What's your, been your biggest positive and negative in this season? Brackets, both in terms of personal life and Villa. And personal yes. personal life, I'll go very quickly. I had a baby this year, so that's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's a positive. Uh, yeah. Uh, negative <laughs> in my personal life? Uh, nothing. Let's just leave that to one side. I also moved house as well. That's nice. Uh, in terms of Villa, though, biggest positive and negative. Now, the easy negative here to get out of the way is that Steven Gerrard wasted 11 games for this season and gave everyone a head start. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the brutal, honest answer. If we were even slightly less were less terrible than we were on Gerrard, we might really be knocking on the door of Europe now with three games to go. I mean, we are, but imagine we had another five points to say from that first 10 games or so. Flip side of that is that if we did get another five points, maybe you know, Emery doesn't take charge because Gerrard isn't sacked after Fulham and yeah, sliding doors. Yeah. Um, biggest positive this season, I would like to think of like a specific game or a goal here or something to be slightly different. But again, the easy answer is that you know, Emery has made us a, an unstoppable force in certain parts of this season and and things look rosy for the, the future ahead. So, biggest negative and positive is the two different managers that we've had this season. Yeah, the they're kind of the obvious ones, so I'll have to go a bit different. I, I mean, you have Sorry to split. About that. <laughs> the season has just split into two, hasn't it? Because, mm. yeah, you can talk. I mean, are there any positives from the, the start of the season? Not that I can think of. I mean, unless you class Kamara and Carlos signing, potentially, I don't know. The biggest negative, I suppose, from that would be Carlos being injured for yeah. pr- pretty much the whole, or most of the season. That's a massive negative. Um, and I suppose, to be honest, the positive I'd go for is that Actually, I think since Emery's come in, I said at the time, and we all know it, whoever was going to come in, they the first job or the biggest job that they had was just to simply improve the players that they've got because we know getting to Europe, it's not going to be oh, £400 million pounds over the next few years. That will get you Europe. Yeah, it's never going to happen. And that's what I think we were trying to do a bit under Gerard, Like he was trying to buy his way, buy his style, if that makes sense. So sign Luca Dean, hopefully he works and other players. And again, I'm not privy to exactly what the strategy was, but it seemed a bit sort of, you know, I can buy Coutinho and hopefully he fits into the system I'm trying to play. Whereas Emery said, mm. right, this is the system and these are the players I've, had, I've got, sorry. I need to now develop and nurture them into their different roles. Um, so for me, it's your Tyra Mings, is, um, Douglas Louise, players like those concert that are now back to where or back, or, you know, or even better, to be honest, than I think a lot of us thought that they were. So now we know we've got a squad full of players that can play under Emery mm-hmm. and Brand Fall that he plays. So for me, the biggest positive is someone like Atara Mings, who, touch wood, has been arguably the most consistent player since Emery's come in. And that's not the space of five or six games. That's what are we now, like 23, 24 games. Um, I don't remember him making one of those 
you know, Mings can have four brilliant games and then we might make one mistake and then people will sort of jump on that and, and you know, criticise him for it. But I don't even remember, unless I'm wrong, him making um, sort of a big error that might have led to a goal. I know under Gerard, there was like maybe one or two at the start of the season, like the Chelsea one where he kind of headed into the air and different bits. But under Emery, I think he's been excellent. And that for me is a huge positive moving forward because yeah. that's your... I mean, John McGinn deserves a shout and obviously Ollie Watkins too. So I don't want to sort of single just one out, but I think Ming sort of epitomises that because he's a player that we all love and we know how good he can be. So for him to step up to it, and as we mentioned in our shoot the other day at the Hockley Social Club, you know, he's shut a lot of people up because of how good he's playing and there's no criticism of him from neutral fans and no one's talking about him in that sort of negative light as what they were before for whatever reason. I don't know why they'd always focus on him. Um but yeah, that's one huge positive for me. Yeah, we'll, when we do our live show in a couple of weeks' time, we'll ask that kind of similar question again, you know, kind of highlight of the season, low light of the season. I would like to think that maybe the, the highlight is yet to come over the next three games and, and it kind of peaks in this crescendo of we qualify for Europe. But that's the positive of the season. Hope that the negative is for the season isn't that we got so close and fell away because I, I still think this season's been, been very good and very kind of progressive regardless of where we end up at the end. But... Like I said, we'll kind of um, reassess positives and negatives at the end of the season. Um, <laughs> question for me here. How are you going to juggle having a newborn whilst doing it an extra European podcast? Now, I like this question <laughs> on two points. It's just like, yes, yes, we're going to qualify for Europe uh, and having a newborn. I mean, it's been a, a strange probably experience having a child while doing the show because that's kind of like before, it'd be like, oh yeah, let's just film whenever. But it's now it's kind of like, well, there's a baby around, like things might happen. Like, we're doing this live at the moment. Like if something happens, I'm going to have to disappear. Like that's not a thing I've had to deal with before. Yeah. Flip side of that is that if we get into Europe, we're doing more shows. I feel a little bit like doing I am here that we want to do more shows. We want to play more games. We want to be involved in these things. We don't want to be doing 38, 38 yeah. podcasts a season. We want to be doing 50 or whatever it is to, to get to FA Cup finals and Europa League finals and whatnot. We want to be doing more shows because we're doing well. So, bring yeah. on the extra content I was like yeah I mean I don't know if you're passing it on to me but I haven't got much to say to this question <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, just in that sort of if we do get into European football our jobs sudden, suddenly become even more packed and stacked like I was sort of thinking of like a content plan around next season and how we can maybe develop things in terms of my sort of actual job of like writing and mm. um, covering the club normally and I was thinking, well, if there's game on Thursday night, then what do we do on the Monday and the Tuesday? Do we lead up to that game or do we do <laughs> post match? Like it's so it's going to be packed and so completely um rammed throughout the week. But that's but that's what, that's we, what we want. That's what fans want. Yeah, it's just going to be late nights and early mornings. But yeah, there's no no complaints. And yeah, there'll be more podcasts and more sort of um, I suppose appetite for it as well. Like over the last month when we did a video a day. Like I think we said at the time, <clears throat> oh, that would be you know, something quite big to look, you know, to achieve. But actually, there was like no expense of our sort of, um, apart from our maybe free time, but there's no expense of the actual work that I do and things like that. So, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. The next question again is uh, is European based, as you might expect. I mean, a few of them are to be fair. Uh, what signings would you make in the two following scenarios if we qualify for Europe and if we don't qualify for Europe? Now, again, I've not picked out any names here, any positions or anything like that. And again, we've already talked about maybe a right back, maybe a striker. So we don't need to go kind of too in depth here, I guess. And again, this is kind of summer content, isn't it? The season's over. This is where we finish. Let's discuss it properly and, and think of names and think of positions. My kind of rough answer to this would be I would almost expect us to sign the same set of players, whether we qualify for Europe or not. Now, again, it's whether you can attract them without the European qualification, but we should be shopping in similar markets because we are a club on the up and players will hopefully be able to see that under Emery. And we get this question a lot about if we don't qualify for Europe, does that affect our draw maybe for, for approaching players or, or signing players? I'd like to think it doesn't because what's the trade-off, I guess? You get seventh in Europa Conference League. That's not this flashy. It's not the Champions League, basically. It's European football, but it's not the Champions League. And that's what players want and the big players want, which is probably a little bit ahead of where Villa can attract at the moment anyway. So I would like to think that if we finish 8th or 7th, uh, Conference League or not, players should be able to see the job that Emery has done so far and the job that they are, they are hoping to do in the future, along with the investment from Nasef Sawiris and Wes Edens, and think that's a club heading in the right direction. And they might not be in, in European football this season coming up, but they will be if I stick with the project for a year or two. 
So I'd like to think that the rough answer to that question is we'll be shopping in similar markets, whether we qualify for Europe or not. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the only difference, and they mentioned Champions League, obviously that's a whole different market. But I think if we qualified for the Europa League, which again, seems very unlikely at this stage, I think that would open maybe a couple more players. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple more, you know, because Europa League is, it, it is better than the Conference League in terms of the opposition you're facing. Once you get through the group stage, you could be playing Barcelona the next sort of round. Um Whereas Conference League is a bit different. It's European football, but for those players who we want to be attracting, who have probably already played in the Champions League or are Champions League players or Europe League players, they're not coming to Villa to play in the Conference League. They're mm. coming to Villa to play in the Premier League, which is a huge draw because, I mean, <laughs> financially, that's probably the biggest wage that they're going to get if they're not going to another Champions League club that is mm. a top team in Italy or Spain or one of the two German clubs <laughs> that seem to compete at the top of their league. Um, so yeah, the Premier League is a massive draw, and especially for a club like ours, which is steeped in history, and there's there's a buzz about it. And I think you know there's a difference between trying to sign for again not to be disrespectful to a Brighton because they're not you know they do their business incredibly well, probably the best you know, of any European team. But us going for a top player, you know is more attractive than other clubs should be saying in the Premier League, I think. Because, again, not just monetary, but, as you say, Emery, the structure that we've now got. So, Alemani, if he comes in, that'll be another draw in terms of he has contacts with agents and mm. it makes that process a lot easier, having someone like him. and you know, So, yeah, those top players we will try and get. I hope that, you know, if it's not first choice striker, it'll be the second or third choice and that will be ambitious enough. So, yeah, it's an exciting summer and what's for sure is that we will be improving. Again, we might not be getting sort of grade A Champions League player because, again, we might finish eighth and Conference League isn't the Champions League. But we're going to improve and as long as Emery has a key set over those transfers alongside Alemani, again, if he comes in, then that fills me with enough confidence. And again, through the sort of one or two transfers that he's made so far, especially Moreno, he's proven that he, he knows certain markets should we say so if we're shopping in Spain you back whoever we sign to mm-hmm. make an impact and if that's the case then we'll we're only looking up in the in the Premier League aren't we so yeah yeah completely agree um next question I believe that we must increase our squad depth if you had to pick one area that isn't perhaps top seven quality at the moment what would it be the one area of the pitch good question right, right back is the obvious answer here isn't it and I, I feel like we're probably maybe being a little bit harsh on Cash in some aspects because he's been out yeah. for a little while as well and we may have almost forgot what he brings. And when he did come back for that spell of... Uh, he returned to the team for four or five games, I think, and he was brilliant. You know, he kept mm. like three clean sheets in four games or whatever it was and defensively he was really good. But we're only saying it because we simply don't know what Emery wants to do in that position. Yeah. We know yeah. at the moment, because this can change in the space of games, at the moment he likes to put Moreno as we attack... Like if this is your back four, he likes to do that, doesn't he? So mm. or that or on the camera. So your left back's going up and your right back almost tucks around. Um, can Cash do that? We'll see. Hopefully he can. And for the sort of small sample size that we've had of him playing over the last couple of months, he he was doing that well. So I think it's more of a question of well, what happens with Young if he goes or if he stays? Well, then the next season, Young isn't going to be here forever. Although he looks like he probably can play. <laughs> There's. A decision there to be made eventually, and yeah. if the, we've got one right back next season, will we have to improve? Would it be an understudy to Matty Cash? I'm not too sure. It would probably be someone who is as good, if not better. I say better, someone that's more suited to Emery because Cash is a brilliant player. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, that seems to be the position that everyone looks at because again, we just don't know what Emery has in store. <laughs> and again, we don't know. He could be trying to replace, you know, I don't know. He, you know, maybe Genduzi comes in and he replaces a Luis or Kamara, and we're all thinking, oh, why has he done that? But then performances might show why. So mm. ultimately, we don't know what he has planned for the team. But as we look at it right now, right back seems to be the one sort of position where, you know, more competition at least, should we say, um, seems to be the sort of, uh, yeah, that's what I think moving into the summer. Yeah. And whoever is the, the Buendia, Bailey, Troy or Ray role, I guess, whether one of those. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. Again, whether that's a, an out and out striker to partner partner Watkins or a more kind of diminutive number ten that's, winger, pacey yeah. forward player. Yeah, because we've been linked um different players, different profiles, but nobody knows apart from Emery and his coaching staff. Even they might not know what Emery has, Emery has planned for the for next season. Maybe he thinks or oh, Watkins can play a different role or we can adjust this and mm. 
tweak that because at the moment we're playing to the player's strengths of what he has now. And that's the key thing of why we've done so well. He isn't shoehorning Watkins into a different role. So in the summer when he signs three or four or five players, they might come in and they will play a role that suits them. So mm. our team could easily change in terms of how we play. But I don't think that'll be something particularly dramatic. So, yeah. Yeah, because when you're talking about the, the left back pushing forward and the right back dropping in, if the right back also pushes forward at the same time, it's that one of the midfielders is going to have to drop in and that creates a different oh, yeah. profile in the t- side as well. So, yeah, just because we're playing this kind of number 10 wide player off the strike at the moment doesn't mean we'll be doing that next season. And well, the season it, it's, it's, it's exciting, yeah. isn't it, to, to see what business could be done and how we'll line up next season. But you, you just think that trust the process that Emery will make it better and it will be improvement on, on what we've seen. So, Sony you want to, to an extent yeah. um, next question is is about kind of structure behind the scenes and I, I guess again this is one that we don't really have the answer to any ideas how Naz and Wes want to set up behind the scenes Perslo, Alaman, Langa, Heck, Unai now, I don't really know anything about this Heck guy um, at all I've not seen anything uh, commercial is, is seems to be the role doesn't it that he's done before and was a yeah. president, whatever that translates into into English football, whether he's going to be involved in a, a commercial aspect and our, our kind of expansion away from Aston Villa with the, the Las Vegas villains and all those kind of things, or whether it will be a, a role day-to-day at Villa Park doing things for Aston Villa in the Premier League remains to be seen. Yeah. But again, you kind of just think we've made some good decisions over the last six months. Let's hope that the ones that we're making now in Alaman and, and Heck are also good decisions. And again, the the structure of Aston Villa might look very, might look very different in six months' time than it has over the last three or four years. Yeah, and so to start with Alamani or Alamani, uh, we do need to clear that up. By the way, I'm, I'm not so not sure. I think it's I think it's Alamania. Alamania, no, okay, think. like Germany. Is it Germany? It's That's what yeah. I said. Yeah, like the French yeah. word for Germany. Yeah, yeah. I did fail my French exam. So. <laughs> um, yeah, Alamania. <laughs> that sounds weird now. He. So let's start with, so Emery, when we obviously approached him and started negotiations with him, it was, we were never going to get Emery saying, you will work under this person and you will be asked to, you know, you know, which player do you want? And we'll give you five of them and you've got to pick which one. It's, uh, we are giving him a lot of control over football operations and mm. he can't do it all by himself, obviously. So he knows that he needs someone to work with that he not necessarily has worked before, sorry not necessarily that he's worked with before but someone who um he can you know work with trust and is used to working in similar markets i suppose is what emery's worked in before you know that that sort of thing so as much i think you know firstly lang is very well respected in the club and has a really good reputation and rightly so but I, we don't know exactly how that's gonna work in terms of if Alemania comes in where langer stands presumably and again i don't know this it would be a situation of langer would work alongside um Alemania, because he's he has that sort of um, you know data driven approach. He has a team of data experts um, that work in the club, and that's going to be really beneficial. So Alemania needs again. He can't do everything on himself. So it's it's, it's like a big recruitment team, right? But they're all they've all got really um, specialized jobs, and they will, they will all contribute. And I think the key thing for me there was as long as Emery can work with those people and buy the players he wants, and they can also recommend players to him and he can have this you know not necessarily the final say but have a big say of well I suppose it's the final say really because those are the players he's going to be working with and I think that's mm. again the key draw of when we approached him we said you've got almost to the point as I mentioned earlier if, if another club would come in for him you, you Villa fans wouldn't worry about it because what would he have of that club that he doesn't have here mm. the only thing would potentially be Champions League football but that's the goal at Villa so that's why he took the job taking the job sorry so yeah, if Alemania comes in and that's a sporting director or whoever, it, or, in, or in a key role that Emery would have obviously asked for, someone that he knows and can trust to deliver the, what he wants in terms of results from recruitment. Um, and yeah, you presume that Langer would work alongside him and with him and, you, you say, contribute his expertise. Uh, in terms of uh, Heck, again, I, I'm not sure how that works so far. It's interesting because obviously there's the MLS expansion that Villa hope to do. Weirdly, though, there is the San the San Diego franchise seems to be now in front of uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, read that this morning. I honestly don't know how that affects the Las Vegas villains sort of um, you know approach because I know we all know that Wes Evans was pushing for that a lot, mm. and 
it's said a lot about it as well to to media over in America. So we'll see what happens there and whether Heck would be, you know, part of the club's um, push for that. I don't know. You know, let's just find out and see. But the key point is that with everyone that's involved with Villa now or everyone that could be involved with Villa, it's a really exciting um, future for the club because that's a, it's a really good, solid structure. And if Emery gives the vote of confidence to it as well, then that's um, yeah. you know, good enough for me. Yeah, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's, this is the kind of thing that won't be cleared up until you know, AVFC official club statement. This is this person has been appointed. This person's moved on. This person's now doing this role instead. But you would assume, without any insight or insider information at all, that you've got Perslo and, and Heck in the top of the pyramid, Alaman and Langer a section below them, and Emery a section below them as a hierarchy. But if Emery at the bottom of that list says jump, I'd expect anyone in that list to say how high. What do you want? I'll do it for you. I'll give you what you want because he's the kind of figurehead of, of Aston Villa. And this is a, a topic that we wanted to talk about on, on another podcast. I don't want to delve into it too much, but it's almost like give give Emery the keys to the, the kingdom and let him do his thing and everything else will kind of fit in place around that. Yeah, That's right, how I would see it as a, has, as a rough kind of guide. Yeah, like he has the autonomy to make big decisions, but at the same time, he's wise enough to know that if he was given, as you say, the keys to the castle... He's not an expert in mm. recruitment or, I mean, he is quite good at recruitment, we, we presume, but that isn't his day-to-day job. His day-to-day job needs to be on the training ground doing what yeah. he does best. And that's what Villa need. He doesn't need to be in, you know, boardroom meetings all the time talking about transfers and recruitment. That's the reason why Alaman would come in to hopefully work alongside Lang. And yeah, as I say, really um, exciting future because of those structures that we would hopefully have in place. Mm. Do you feel Europe has come a little too soon for us and we should have next season to consolidate with new players and then head on up? Do we have enough quality players to assault the league, cups and European football? I hate these kind of questions. <laughs> I say that. I don't know who sent this one in, by the way. I'm not digging out you know, different opinions at all, but I just don't get the narrative of like, we're not ready for European football. Well, it's the 10th of May as we record this. That there's a whole transfer window to go. Are we ready right this second with Ashley Young playing right back? Obviously not. Will we, will we be ready on August 1st or whenever the season starts? I'd like to think so because we've had enough time to recruit and, and train those players and have a pre-season and work on a system. So, yes, we're not ready right this second, but we don't kick off in Europe. Well, we haven't qualified yet, but we don't play our first qualifying game in the Conference League tomorrow. So... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just don't like these questions. Is it too soon? Are we ready or not? I yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, if you qualify, then you're ready enough because your players are good enough to win enough games to qualify. And especially for a club like us who will attack the transfer market with, you know, money to spend and wise recruitment, I hope um, our squad will improve. So I, I, I have no worries about squad depth and are we ready? Because, I mean, my take on it, and I've said this before, in terms of the, um, let's say, the three to four, five-year plan of Aston Villa, I can understand some people or whatever it may be saying that if you get Conference League, then that would be sort of more potentially beneficial for the club moving into the next few years because let's say we're successful in the Conference League, which I'd hope we would be, considering we would be one of the best teams in it. If we were to win that competition, we would then be in the Europa League. Like if West Ham win it this year, then they will be next year. If we were in the Europa League instead, then we'd have Europa League football next year. Then that's you know great. But I don't think we'd, our league campaign will be as successful. And I don't think we'd, who knows, maybe we would win the Europa League, but we'd have a better chance of winning the Conference League. And after then, over the next two years, you are going to have better players. Emery, we're going to have clearly more time at the club so in terms of a natural progression conference league to then get Europa League then that makes sense but I don't think we can have any sort of that's looking at it too um too sort of I don't know detailed if that makes sense like you Mm. just qualify for what you can and get it because Emery has said before you know while we want him to be here for a long time, we also want him to have as much success we want to utilize as much as we can (laughs) under this manager so there's no um yeah he, he said he doesn't want to sort of waste waste time with it you know the, we don't want to not qualify this year because we might have a better squad next year that's not the point we just want to qualify and, and get the job done it, I, I wouldn't worry about squad depth and stuff but I can understand the argument of like in terms of the natural progression where a villa are going to be in two or three years if we qualify for the Europa League for example this year um then next year we might not have Europe because we might have been knocked out of the Europa League and the league 
campaign might have suffered as a result if he won the conference mm. league, be in Europa League, and then it would be like a so yeah. Uh, again, there's no worries on whatever we do. As long as it's successful, no one's going to be complaining. It's probably just a sort of mentality of some Villa fans, which, again, is completely fine. Of We aren't used to too much success, so we kind of think, oh, do we need it right now? I don't know. It, I think I it's... Know. I think the overall is whether the club's ambition match, matches its resources. So you get the same conversations had about promotion to the Premier League. Are we ready to Are we ready to stay up with the squad we've got? And for some that come up and go straight back down, the answer is clearly no, because they don't have the resources to to fund that ambition for Villa yes they almost did fall apart on that first season back but they signed a lot of players in that summer because they had to their ambition yeah. was to stay up and they could fund that and effectively they did the task they stayed up and now we're an established Premier League side again hopefully looking up and, and, and rather than over our shoulder ever again if you look at the playoff semi-final in the, the playoff final coming up in the championship with Coventry Luton I can't think of the other two Middlesbrough and somebody else who's the third fourth England yeah. Sundern, yeah, Sundern almost maybe getting promoted almost ahead of their time with a lot of youngsters in their squad and only yeah. just really getting into the, the championship. So if a, a Luton come up, they wouldn't be ready for the Premier League and they don't have the funds to match the ambition of staying in the league. So you'd, you'd be worried about them going forward. For Villa to get into Europe too soon, it's we've got the uh, the funds to match the ambition of we'll compete in Europe then and we'll give you seven big, big signings. So yeah. are we ready right now? No. Can we be ready for it if we qualify? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the key point. Like, there's things will change over the summer, and Emery's come here to play in Europe. He doesn't want to have more than you know. Obviously, he want or he's enjoyed a week of training um, from you know in terms of working with Villa, which we hadn't had working at other clubs in Europe. But he mm. doesn't want that. He wants he wants European nights, and so do we. We can't be sort of picky with it. Um, so. Yeah, again, it's going to be a tough ask to get European football this season anyway. But if we were to get it, I don't think anyone's going to be sitting there. If if we beat Brighton on the final day and we get it and thinking, oh no, but the squad depth. <laughs> no one's going to be complaining. Yeah, exactly. Next question. If you could bring back a former player to fight for European football in the final three games, who would you pick? I love questions like this. A little bit of silliness in here. So any former player that's played for Villa, they don't have to still be playing. They could be retired. They could be a club legend, whatever approach you want to go with. They can join the squad now to face Spurs, Liverpool and Brighton to try and get Villa into Europe. Who are you picking? <laughs> um... I think it would. I think to be honest, anything beneath that double pivot that we have is fine. Like I think defensively, we're okay. We've proven that um, we're not going to ship many goals. Touch wood. And the midfield, I think, is okay. But I mean, to be honest, I look at the position next to Watkins and I think, well, who could we put in there? But it kind of just goes out the window because I was watching Jack Grealish play at Real Madrid last night. So mm. <laughs> can't really look beyond that. Like it's just a world-class player that we could just have I suppose if this question isn't hypothetical or is hypothetical <laughs> so Jack like how could you not I don't know like there's mm. obviously these are the players who could be more I don't know do you bring in a different right back a different centre half ultimately Jack Grish is the best player I've ever seen play for Villa so put him in yeah I mean that's a, <laughs> to be honest when I thought of this question uh, when I like, thought of my answer when I saw the question I, I don't even disregarded Jack existed um, I, I've gone for Ben Teke for mine I thought like the out-and-out out striker to partner Watkins rather than a kind of 10 winger role. Yeah. Prime Benteke that scores you know, 18 goals, whatever, in the Premier League when we were crap. If he can just bang a header in against Liverpool away or something to get you some unexpected points, like, how mad would that be? Like, we had a good yeah. record at Anfield under Lambert, to be fair. Prime Benteke coming back, picking up points against Spurs, picking up points against Liverpool. You don't even need to be Brighton on the last day because Benteke's bagged a hat-trick or something. Yeah, that'd be class. And if you get two, you get Vyman and Benteke, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get, get Prime Gabby up there as well for the triple threat. <laughs> yeah. uh, nah, I like those questions. Uh, comment section is great. It's great shout for that. Chat, and... Sorry, I was just saying, probably could have gone a bit more detailed with that. But... No, I'm I mean, not... Jack's, like you said, Jack's one of the best players you've, we've seen. Like He's a, a, yeah. a world-class talent that slots slot straight into a bit of a problem position for Villa. I've gone for the same, but an out-and-out striker. But that kind of number 10 player that's playing off Watkins is clearly the one that we both think uh, a bit of improvement there won't go miss John Carew James Milner and Juan Pablo Angel uh, three shouts in the in the comments which um, Angel's a bit of a rogue one but don't mind that. yeah um, where to next um, away from Europe a little bit because we've talked about it a lot will any of the low knees make it 
Now, I guess, first of all, what is your definition of make it? Uh, and second of all, will they make it? For sure, that means the first team, um, as in subs uh, starting. Uh, it's difficult because Emery, I don't know how to word it, he hasn't really given much of an opportunity to some of the youngsters we have in in this, uh, sorry, or available, I suppose. I mean, we've had the sort of um, two goalkeeper situation. I think mm. a couple of times we haven't had, or we haven't maxed out the subs bench. I know he took Caden Young to, um, where did we go? Saudi Arabia, the UAE. I know he did that. Um, I don't know. It's difficult. Look at Kessler Hayden and he's still at the club, but he hasn't appeared on the bench, I don't think, unless I'm wrong, since Emery's come in. So they have a, it's a bit of an uphill task, I think, for some of them. Um, I mean, you look at who's ready right now. You would look at Tim, Ruben, who's had, or as far as I know, he's had a good spell at QPR. I know they've struggled, but I think that's that can be sort of pushed in another way. And so well, that's a good learning experience for him. He's been in mm. in a team that are fighting for their fighting for their lives in a way. So I know also at the start of the season they were top. <laughs> um, obviously, Cameron Arch is the obvious other one. You know, we could talk about that. You sort of do a separate video on Cameron Archer. Obviously, if we're going to be signing another striker, then where does that leave Archer? I think the only way that he sort of has a run in the team or can be in and around the squad is if we get Europe and John Durand leaves on loan. That would be the mm. only way. I think that signed. might happen. I think John Durand might go on loan next year. Yeah, maybe to Vittoria or something. It would make sense. Um but again, it's difficult because we haven't actually seen enough of him. But for what I have seen of him, I think he's very good. So maybe he's too good for Vittoria. I don't know. Emery's working with him every day. So I'm sure the decision they take on him will be the right one. But if he goes on loan, then that opens the door for Cameron Archer. But then if mm. it's no European football, then kind of shuts again. Because Cameron Archer has to be playing week in, week out, or at least most games in a season, whether he's coming off the bench or whatever. So it's difficult. I think if, maybe if Borough go up, do they look at him and sign him? Would be asking for a lot of money because ultimately that's an under twenty one international for England who's scoring, you know, loads of goals in the championship. As did Tammy Abraham and other strikers who have forged mm-hmm. really careers for themselves. So suddenly it's weird because when we were in the championship, we were crying out for that player. Like, who can we get on loan from the Premier League club that's going to do really well? And all of a sudden, we have that player. So yeah, it, well, you know, what do you do with this? I would give him an opportunity, but I'm saying that when Villa haven't signed that marquee striker that I presume we will. So it's difficult. And it's, I wonder what Archer thinks about it as well. Obviously, he wants to break into our team. But if there's no opportunity knocking, I think you need to leave while you can sort of thing and while your stock's high. So, yeah, we'll see. And again, the other one would probably be Tim. Unless I've missed one, I don't... I think mostly the lone... Uh, uh, Aaron Ramsey as well, I think, is one that's yeah. done well. But again, where's the opportunity coming? Hopefully there's one there. But I'm just being honest, I don't see it. And I don't think Emery will start those players in the Premier League. He might bring them off the bench, maybe. But our squad depth is going to only improve through signing three or four or five players anyway in the summer. So it is difficult. You're looking at another couple of loans for some of them, I think. Mm. But at what point, if we're getting better, then when, you know, I, yeah, it's tough. So I think, again, it's maybe a podcast in general of. Villa's big sort of recruitment push in terms of the academy and the big investments that we're putting in. Where does are we going to see those profits sort of thing in the mm. first team? I don't know. We'll I, hopefully, I think it's almost the role of the academy now. It's probably different to what it was when we were in the championship. Yeah. That it was like it's it's now like can we look to the academy to bolster our squad in a difficult league and find some talent to help us push on? Because you know it's probably easier to blood a player in the championship. I mean, it's still a difficult league, but it's a lesser standard and you've maybe not got as much transfer spend. So if you then kind yeah. of rocket up the league and you want to get into Europe, you're going to constantly add these 20 million players, 40 million players to your starting 11 and your current starting 11 are going to drop to the bench. So if your bench was made up of youngsters, they just kind of disappear into thin air and it's another loan for... Tim Irubunum or another loan for Aaron Ramsey or whoever it is if you can't loan out these players in the hope that they might be a world beater and get into your first team that feels very very unlikely unless you produce a, another Jack Grealish which is obviously the aim yeah. if the role of the academy is to make four, five, six players who are good professionals who go on to have careers in the game but not at Aston Villa's level but also brings in 70 million every five years or something 
you kind of go, well, that's maybe that's the role of the academy going forward. They're not good enough to break into a top six Premier League side, Aston Villa, but they are good enough to go to Middlesbrough for 15 million or Norwich City for 10 million or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that is, uh, that's the key point. I think that's one of the main reasons why we're putting so much investment in the academy because it's revenue that it's, it's pure profit, isn't it? So, mm. and that's, that sounds a bit like, you know, I don't know. It's ruthless, but, but that, that's, that's modern those, football. But those players, they might have a potential disappointment that they don't make it at Villa, but they've got brilliant careers ahead of them. Again, Cameron mm. Archer's probably gone out on loan to Preston and Middlesbrough and he's thought, well, actually, there's a life away from Villa that I'd more like, you know. The, the, so, as well as the other players, if you're playing in the Football League, that's not a bad career at all. It's so hard to make it in the first team. Like That's why I don't think we put enough praise on Jacob Ramsey sometimes because he's nearly made his 100th Premier League appearance. Mm. So, yeah, um, it's, just, it's just difficult to sort of predict and you don't want to sort of predict players' futures. I mean, but either way, a lot of them have, you know, say, brilliant careers ahead of them. It just might not be with Villa. We'll find out. But I think that's a key point you made there, Dan. Like, I think it was Sammy Mockbell, I think, who wrote an article about Arsenal and the sort of academy, the well-renowned academy that they have. So Enketia, Smith Rowe, Saka, other players that have come through at the moment, uh, some of them, even they're not good enough, some of them to be playing like Smith Rowe and Enketia because Arsenal are going so well but it's also proof of progress for the club so it's difficult because it's a player's career but at the same time if they can't break in it kind of proves that Villa are going on the right way that, I know that sounds really ruthless but it needs to be put into sort of perspective of those players will still have really good careers away from Villa if they don't make it in the first team of a top six Premier League club is what you know because that's what that's what we're, where Villa want to be so it's incredibly mm-hmm. difficult that's the last of the serious football questions that we had. We've got three kind of more silly ones to end the show. And I only put these in at the start. I thought, yeah, well, we're an Aston Villa podcast. Let's get this Aston Villa chat out of the way first. So we've done 40-odd minutes there. Uh, lots of European chat, transfers. And there's a lot of things there that we've talked about that we'll probably continue to talk about for the next few weeks over the summer because it's an ever-changing dynamic, isn't it? You link with somebody else or somebody leaves and it kind of ignites a new conversation. What's your go-to takeaway, John? <laughs> um, I ever go for an Indian or a Chinese I don't really go for anything else is it, yeah, what else is class, two, two classics there you've pulled out of the bag I, I know people have like um, I don't know like a sushi or something but I just don't that's not my bag at all my no. go-to would be a lamb biryani Indian oh nice and a naan bread on the side yeah that's my go-to nice lamb's a good choice for a curry underrated choice lamb what, what, um, what naan bread are you going for just standard just like a plane. Just a standard plane on, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, you know what's interesting? And I've got, I've got to stay true to my roots here. I said naan bread then, but I say nan bread in real life. Nan so bread. I've got, to, I've got to clarify that. I always say naan oh, bread, I don't know why. Nan bread, no. I, I don't know, maybe I'm saying it wrong. Uh, now I'm pretty sure it is naan bread, but I said it then and I felt wrong saying it, so I've got to clarify right. that. I'd normally say naan bread in my in my real life, so I can't have this persona that I say naan bread on the podcast. Um <laughs> Yeah, Chinese, Indian. If you're going to say what's a takeaway, most people are going to say those two. Like, is fish and chips a takeaway? It's kind of, yes, but you don't kind of class it as that. Would you order a fish and chips and, like, just eat or something? That feels, <laughs> that feels like, illegal. Um, I'll go Chinese, just to, to be opposite to you. Like, sweet and sour, kind of chow mein kind yeah. of that kind of vibe. Duck, I like crispy duck, things like that. Um, what was the um, other nonsense one? <laughs> I don't know why. The, some of these questions. Dude, literally, it was three words. Dogs or cats? <laughs> dogs or dogs or cats? Or dogs, or cats? <laughs> dogs or cats? Um, I mean, in what aspect do you prefer dogs? Do you prefer cats? Yeah, yeah. Would you rather have a dog or a cat? Yeah, um, I mean, it sounds weird. I like both. <laughs> uh, I'm more of a dog person, though. We've had a dog. Yeah. We've had we've had a cat, and we've had two dogs in my family. We've had two boxers, box dogs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the breed we've sort of gone for, I suppose you could say. But yeah, I, I'm I like all animals. I'm I'm, I'm like Ricky Gervais in that way. <laughs> so I don't want to don't want to sort of poo on cats, but um, yeah, like a dog is a dog's the best one. <laughs> what a comparison! I wasn't expecting 45 minutes into this podcast. I like Ricky Gervais. I like all animals. Uh, dogs for me. Yeah, we've had a dog, Chocolate Lab. Uh, he's five five years old now. I think cats hate them. Not like again, you're like, oh, yeah. I love all animals, all that. I'm not going to go out and do anything to a cat. I don't like them. Like, we've got um, 
one in my partner's side of the family. And I, I, honestly, I say, like, oh, I don't like cats, whatever. It's like, oh, no, it's fine. Like, it's okay. So it's kind of like sat next to me. I was stroking his head a little bit. It bit me. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, that's a, that's a cat. Like, I've done nothing wrong and I've been bitten. Like, a dog wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> cats are just looking for the next meal. Dogs, like, actually care about you. So, yeah, dog, <laughs> dogs for the win. Uh, and the final question, which I pro- I'm guessing you've not prepared anything for this if you've not seen them. What's your best joke? Go on. You got one? <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't got one more. I don't have yeah. a best joke. I'd, again, I've, I've seen this discussion central before and I, I don't have like a joke. Do you know what I mean? I think some people have a joke that like when they go to parties or whatnot or business yeah. meetings, like they have a joke that they wheel out. Oh, I don't meetings. have that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's strange. I think that's a very old fashioned thing. Like, oh, I know a joke. Like, here's a joke that I know that I tell when I go places. So I've Googled like the top 10 jokes and tried to find one that I found was funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to read it to you. And if you don't laugh, I probably won't. <laughs> then I'll be very disappointed. Okay. Um, I need to find actually, this, I mean, bear, bear with me, Facebook Live, because I screenshot it on my phone. So <laughs> bear with me one sec. I've got so many pictures of my son on here. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, ready? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is my go-to joke now, if I can remember it. A bear walks into a bar and says, give me a whiskey and a Coke. Why the big paws, says the bartender. The bear shrugs. I don't know. I was born with them. <laughs> Bad. I, I got I got half of it. I don't get the I don't I don't get the end of it. He's got big paws. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, that's the joke. <sighs> I don't because I was born with it at the end. Do remember there's the end of season review coming up live at the Hockey Social Club where I'll try and find a better joke than that one because uh, that went down like a lead balloon. Uh, <laughs> tickets are available. They're absolutely free. There'll be a link in the description down below. There's beer. There's food. Um, we're going to be doing the end of season review. We'll do an audience Q and A. We're raising money for charity via a raffle once again, and it'll be a good night regardless of what the um, uh, how the season ends up, whether we qualify for Europe or not. So, like I said, tickets are down below for that. John, thanks for joining me for this Q&A. We'll be back for a Spurs preview next, I believe. Massive, massive game. Um, so, press conference, I assume, is Friday. So, we'll be back then to chat about what Emery said there. Thank you very much for watching this show. We'll see you again on Friday. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your thoughts and comments. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa.